No matter what you might think of China, it is a growing global superpower. Some have denounced it as an ethno-nationalist state, while some have welcomed it as a potential challenge to US global hegemony. Some have contended that China's rise to power spells the demise of democracy, while others reply that China would bring actual socialist democracy to the world. The discourse surrounding China seems to me, a Chinese citizen, to be highly dichotomous and not helpful. Either you are a Stalinist apologist with Chinese characteristics, or you are an apologist for American global domination with imperialist characteristics. In this video, I explore several key psychoanalytical and philosophical concepts in the context of recent Chinese political, social, and cultural developments. If you like this type of videos and want to see more of it, please go ahead and give a like and subscribe. As a small channel, I don't make any money off YouTube, so this is really motivational for me to keep creating content. All right, with that out of the way, let's talk about Hong Kong. In this video, I'll introduce you to the political historical background of the city's unrest. And in the later parts of this video, I'll go into the philosophy of various parties, events, and policies. Hong Kong never had a smooth political climate since its return to Chinese sovereignty. The city's two political camps have debated the institutions of the region's political organization from day one. The two camps named themselves pro-establishment and pro-democracy, but so as to not bring in undue biases because of the naming, I will refer to them as widely the Governing Conservative Coalition and the Opposition Coalition. However, it is important to remember that these two don't map on accurately to the American political structure due to local political history. The Basic Law of Hong Kong, a constitutional document of the Special Administrative Region, promised that the chief executive be eventually selected by means of universal suffrage following a nomination from a committee with quote-unquote broad representation. Noticeably, the Basic Law never promised a specific timeline for universal suffrage, and this has been an issue of contention ever since Hong Kong's return. Aside from the position of the chief executive, Hong Kong's legislative council has also been riddled with ambiguities from its very start. Before the electoral reforms of 2021, the council had 70 seats in total. Of these 70 seats, half would be directly elected by universal suffrage of geographical constituencies. Basically, as an average resident of Hong Kong, you would vote for only half of what composed of the legislative council. The other half would be elected from functional constituencies. These represent different industries and sectors of the community which are considered important to Hong Kong. This includes everything from finance to law to insurance. These seats are elected by professional or special interest groups. When in the United States corporate lobbies convince you to vote for pro-corporate or pro-capitalist policies, in Hong Kong, corporations get to vote themselves. It should come as no surprise that the functional constituencies consistently lean towards the conservative parties who tend to protect corporate interests. It is against this background that liberal camp consistently advocated for full elections of the legislative council and the chief executive. This was the stated goal of the Occupy Central movement and the Umbrella Revolution of 2014. However, no changes were made and protesters were dispersed. This resulted in further radicalization of some opposition political figures who turned to localism and independence movements, some of whom gradually gradually shifted right to acquire a nationalist and racist characteristic in their advocacies. In June 2019, another round of protests erupted over the proposed quote-unquote extradition bill, which would enable Hong Kong authorities to extradite criminals to mainland China, Macau, and Taiwan. This bill was perceived as the first step to a loss of judicial independence in Hong Kong. The protest escalated further that summer, from peaceful demonstrations to direct actions in breaching the legislative council council complex, occupying the airport and temporarily suspending flights, general strikes and street confrontations against the police. In July, the Yunlong incident saw a turning point in the political atmosphere where triad members and police were perceived to cooperate in indiscriminately attacking protesters. Trust in the police turned to an all-time low and more protesters began to embrace direct action over peaceful demonstrations. Violent confrontations became increasingly commonplace as protesters and police began to see each other as deadly enemies. Against this backdrop, more protesters turned from moderate pro-democracy advocates to pro-independence advocates who rejected anything that came from up north. The introduction of the national security law in May 2020, however, largely ended the movement. The text of the law published on the day it went into effect made, quote, secession, collusion, 
subversion, terrorism, criminal activities, subject to punishment up to life in prison. In its enforcement, the signature flag of the movement was found to be subversive, any public display of which would become a violation of the law. Multiple opposition and media organizations were disbanded, and the law was retroactively applied to crimes prior to the legislation. Of course, this was not unique to China. Similar laws were consistently applied in the West in persecuting leftist activists, a line repeatedly stated by state media encouraging the mentality of what aboutism. Further electoral changes followed in 2021. The total number of seats were increased to 90, but the section of the council, which were elected by universal suffrage, decreased to 20 seats. The functional constituencies now had 30. The remaining 40 seats were now elected by an electoral committee of 1,488 people. Before the 2021 reforms, this committee was responsible for nominating and voting for chief executives, now, this committee could also nominate and elect 40 seats of the Legislative Council. Furthermore, any candidate for any seat in the Council was to be approved by this committee. And you guessed it, this committee is overwhelmingly conservative. Candidates are further required approval from an Electoral Qualification Board, which is composed of government officials, who are overwhelmingly conservative. As a result, the 2021 elections saw very few candidates from the opposition camp, and unsurprisingly, the composition of the 2021 Legislative Council is fully conservative, with several moderate or non-aligned representatives to sort of balance it out. Under the guise of democracy, the anti-China forces have undermined democracy behind their rhetoric of so-called democracy is a sinister intention to subvert the constitutional order of the special administrative region and seize their rights to govern Hong Kong. This article was published by Xinhua, the state news agency of the PRC in March 2021. I think it's a very interesting place to start our exploration of what we would call the symbolic order in Hong Kong. To any rhetoric of law and order, we must ask, what is the order that is being disrupted here? To this quote, we must ask, what is the constitutional order that is being disrupted? Well, the apologist for the state replies everything. They could point to vandalized metro stations, sabotaged legislative council buildings, bricks to windows of stores. They could point to the occupied airport, the defaced national emblem, or the burnt national flags, but none of these individual incidents is the constitutional order itself. We could say that these are examples or manifestations of the order being disrupted, but examples are never the thing in itself. If we use the words of French philosopher and psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, the constitutional order is a part of the symbolic order or the big other. So what is the symbolic order? Well, the psychoanalyst Lacan had a Freudian legacy. Both were interested in how the infant human in a biological sense came to develop into persons in a social sense. Basically how people became subjects, subjects like Descartes, who can say, I think, therefore I am. Subjects are those who can define, I am. Only then can subjects enter the social realm and interact with other people. Without subjectivity, you do not have a coherent identity of the self, and your entire existence is broken. Lacan says that this subjectivity develops following the mirror stage, in which an infant recognizes themselves in a mirror as an ideal self, and forms an identity around that mirror image. We can of course debate this characterization, but that's just how Lacan frames it. Lacan identified three parts of the human psyche and experience, and these three parts are by no means isolated or detached. They are very much interactive with each other. They are called the real, the imaginary, and the symbolic. Plastic Pills has a great video on this, which introduced me to Lacanian psychoanalysis in the first place, so go check out his videos. Here, I am just going to briefly tell you about the symbolic. The symbolic order is a structure, a system, if you will, that exists outside of oneself. You are born into a symbolic order, and although you can make your own variation of it, you do not create it yourself. Think of it like language. Languages are composed of signs, which are made up of two parts, the signifier and the signified. The signifier is the cluster of sounds you say, and the signified is what you mean. That is a master of uh, simplification, but I hope you get the point. The problem with language, however, is that you cannot just stop 
stop at the signified. Because how do you describe a signified? You use more signifiers. The problem becomes even more acute when you have words like the law. What is the law? Can you point to a signified of the word law? No, you need more signifiers to explain this one signifier. Hence, you have a signifier chain. And where does this signifier chain stop? It stops with the master signifier. The master signifier points to itself, and hence it ends the chain. For example, consider the signifier money. It signifies value under a capitalist system. If we use the Marxian analysis of the capitalist language system, value and money under capitalism are reduced to one and the same. Value is only represented by money. You cannot represent it in any other way. And this system reproduces itself by justifying everything that it does by itself. This is the symbolic order and the master signifier is at the center of it. To use a symbolic order like language or morality to participate in human society, you need to tacitly accept all the rules that it has and you have to do it at an unconscious level. It wouldn't work if you tried doing it consciously every time. You can't consciously decide to follow or defy certain moral imperatives every day after you have adopted a moral system. Otherwise, your daily life can't really go on. It is very important that you accept the existing system as is in order for you to participate in any conversation under this symbolic order, even if you're trying to go against what the system itself protects. Language control for this reason is mind-numbingly effective in controlling political discourse. We'll touch on that in the future video. So then, what is the constitutional order here? It is precisely this master signifier or the big other. It is the ultimate justification for everything, and this order is not neutral. Let's look at another example, Stalinism. It claims to serve the people, but when an actual majority of people show up in the streets to protest Soviet rules in Hungary, the Stalinists would ruthlessly crush the uprising, claiming that this is merely a small minority and not actually the people. Order is the big other that we imagine. It does not actually exist. It serves only as a perpetual justification for action. We don't want to do this either. But you guys are making it very difficult. You guys are disrupting the order. So what does the protester do then? They find a new big other. They find a new master signifier. Spend any time in the telegram chat of a protester group or read their online blogs and you will see this unique lingual structure everywhere. The big other here is democracy and freedom in the Western sense. Biting off police's fingers, it's fine. It's part of the struggle for democracy. Burning people alive in streets, it's fine because the movement stands for democracy. Under this new symbolic order, protesters do not need to follow the old rules of the old symbolic system, symbolic order anymore. Law and order in the previous symbolic order is now represented as tyranny of the Chinese commies and so on. This explains the perplexing adage using the guise of democracy to undermine democracy. Because although those signifier democracy stays the same, the term is being combated over by two very, very different symbolic orders. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Every society, every social interaction needs a symbolic order or else we will have no connection with our fellow human beings. Yet this master signifier and the big other are also the ultimate legitimizers for every horrible thing humans can do on earth. In truth, there is no big other. It only lives in our imagination. As Slavoj Žižek will put it, this is the tragedy of our predicament. In order for a disrupted traditional symbolic order to reassert itself against something that has refused to enter the order by adopting a different system of language and rules, it needs to reinvent itself and incorporate the challenge into the system. When a system is confused, it needs to explain the existence of a rebellious subject in its own terms in order to reassert control and stop being confused. So how does this system explain the rebellious subject? Hmm. The phrase anti-China forces along with external forces and foreign powers is part of common parlance in state press releases at this point. The term obviously seeks to evoke a sense of otherness and of course to transfer blame. Let's see what anti-China forces have been responsible for. Poisoning the minds of young Chinese people, sponsoring LGBTQ liberation, sponsoring feminism, and most famously or infamously, chief of all anti-China forces, President Biden has been responsible for playing the Marx Engels card against Beijing.
Sometimes I really do wonder if the Chinese Communist Party and the U.S. Republican Party could like switch their party platforms, and there wouldn't be anything wrong, you know? Okay. Now, if you know anything about political history, then you would realize that this is not an uncommon rhetoric for politicians to use when they want to redirect attention for embarrassing domestic situations. But as a part of a larger political strategy, when it is consistently used in the context of a movement with questionable or even totalitarian tendencies, the philosopher Hannah Arendt will warn us this could be a characteristic of totalitarianism. Hannah Arendt was a German Jewish philosopher whose works heavily influenced West Western political theory. In particular, her work, The Origins of Totalitarianism, provided chilling analysis of the conditions in which totalitarian regimes arise, the fragility of freedom, and how propaganda, scapegoats, terror, and political isolation all aided in the slide toward what she calls total domination. This book is not without controversy. In particular, her analysis of anti-Semitism, in which she claims that Jews share parts of the responsibility for their own genocide, sparked some debate among scholars. Some claim that her critiques of Marxism are less than informed, while others claim that comparing Stalin to Hitler created a false sense of equivalence between the two. Nevertheless, the section on totalitarianism of the work remains important for our political series and discussions today. In Origins, Arendt tries to answer the central question that has been haunting European academia since the rise of Nazi Germany. How did this happen? Arendt's answers traces the history of totalitarianism all the way to the origins of anti-Semitism and imperialism, the two of which would culminate into totalitarianism. Totalitarianism, in Arendt's terms, required the dissolution of the boundaries between reality and fiction, and hence creating a mass mentality of cynicism and gullibility. The masses are gullible, as they take in the lies of the totalitarian, since totalitarian ideologies claim that there is a scientific truth that humanity must be compelled to realize, and that the leader has monopolized this knowledge and will therefore always be right, wouldn't that mean that the leader never lies? Okay, but what if the lie is so obviously false? Take QAnon. Its predictions have been discredited for many times, but it still has a solid foundation of supporters revolving around their support for Donald Trump. Well, then the masses turn cynical. Faced with the incontestable evidence that what they previously believed was a lie, the crowd protests that they have always known that it was a lie and admire the tactical genius of the leader in fooling the gullible people outside the movement. Notice in this process, reality is abolished. The sense of reality which would unmask the liar or force the liar to live up to the consequences of their promises is eliminated. The masses follow the leader no matter what happens. And where does this leave the leaders? Well, in a place where they are liberated from the contents of their own ideology, in Arendt's own words. Because everything that the leader does can now be justified with cynicism and tactical ingenuity in pursuit of the real ideological goal, the leader is in effect no longer bound by said ideological goal. We see this perfectly in Hong Kong. In pursuit of the ideological goal of the people's democracy, the ruling party is not bound by what democracy would require one to do. And the broader propaganda that China releases, especially the now infamous clip where Chen Ping, a professor of the National School of Development at Peking University, claims that the West is playing the Marx Engels card on China. In this clip, Chen analyzes that China's global advantage is its cheap labor force. The main weapon that the West could use against China is to increase the cost of labor and thereby deprive China of its global competitiveness. Hence, he suggests that the West is sponsoring unionizing efforts in China and promoting quote-unquote so-called Marxism. There is even this wonderful cartoon series featuring a dodgy white guy paying union leadership to spread ideas about labor rights. Now, let's not stay on this for too long. Mm. Who am I kidding? This is just too funny. Stay with me here and remember that the government which officially released a set of cartoons is a communist party.
In the first picture, we have a white guy giving some materials about a non-governmental organization to a Chinese man. They both look very dodgy because obviously we can't have any citizen organization outside the state. In the second picture, the guy stands at the podium and instructs workers on how to organize workers to secure your rights and how to organize free unions and how to take to the streets to express your voices. This would of course lead to workers being instructed on Western labor theory and Western union theory, leading to a protest in which workers demand increases in wages, decreases in work hours, as well as a fair labor environment. Of course our dodgy white guy is, is paying the protest. Someone actively reports this whole arrangement. The organizer is promptly arrested and the white guy is of course running for his life. The end. Obviously, the Chinese Communist Party here has completely liberated itself from the shackles of its own ideology as supposedly the party of a worker farmer coalition. Now this would quite literally defy common sense if you are not a part of the totalitarian movement. How how would a capitalist country, the United States of America, exports Marxism in a Marxist country, the People's Republic of China? Well, obviously, the totalitarian replies, there is a deeper level of realism here. China is the only power challenging US hegemony around the world, and so even if we bend our ideological contents a bit, it is fine. The US is a quote, dying power. And so even if they use everything at their disposal, it isn't strange. And the fact that our workers are underpaid and oppressed and such, that is much like, uh, capitalism? Mm, well, that's just part of a grand plan to national rejuvenation under socialism with Chinese characteristics. Under this framework, the fictitious becomes factual to members of totalitarian movements. In a sense, this idea of fighting against the foreign subversive forces, or whatever is precisely what Zizek would call the big other. In his film The Pervert's Guide to Ideology, he rejects the claim that without God, everything is allowed. Instead, he points out that it is precisely when we have a godlike figure, be it the people, the force of history, uh, racial science, or whatever it is in that context, that everything is allowed. How can you be bound by earthly moral laws when you answer to a superior calling? Quite contrary to Marxist diagnosis of religion as the people's opium, we could perhaps say that religion, or the big other figure, is the people's cocaine. It stimulates anger and passion, which totalitarian movements redirect to surrogating power for the totalitarian movement. So, I've been quite critical about China so far, you know, uh, comparing it to Nazi Germany, saying it's totalitarian state while still living in its borders. Uh, please, national security, if you're watching this, I don't really want to be arrested. Let's talk about the other side. Now, like any political opposition to a ruling regime, the Hong Kong opposition forces are very, very diverse in their political advocacies. Basically, it ranges from demanding police reforms, electoral universal suffrage, and release of unjustly detained political prisoners, to calling for the sovereignty and independence of the Hong Kong nation state and the creation of that nation state, which would be explicitly xenophobic against mainland Chinese people, who many figures on the opposition have labeled as parasites to the body politic in Hong Kong. In the 2019 protest, most of these opposition figures formed a wide coalition and united in opposing the government, but it is hugely important to recognize that many of the political goals of these decentralized protest movements are fundamentally not reconcilable. You cannot both have a liberal democracy and cause some sections of your population parasites who need to be removed from the body politic. In the Chinese official responses to the protest movements, many have focused on the radical end of the opposition who calls for independence, as China has had a history of being subject to imperialist colonization. The memories of the imperialist past haunts the populace, and the same populace who are subject to a patriotic education in mainland China would stand with the central government in opposing any attempt to separate a territory from the governance of Beijing. What is the composition of the opposition like then? A poll conducted by the Initium might help us out here. The poll was conducted in June 2020, shortly after the passage of the National security law of Hong Kong by the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Around 1,500 people were surveyed. The results are quite revealing. Of all respondents, 51% broadly leaned toward the opposition side, with 20% identifying themselves as localists, that is, the political camp calling for Hong Kong independence. 44% of young people aged between 15 and 29 identify as localists, and 28% as Democrats 
only 2% identify as conservatives. Again, it is important to recognize that this is a diverse group of people, and critiquing the localists has been a common rhetorical strategy by the CCP to delegitimize anyone in the opposition. But given how I have critiqued the CCP so far, it seems only fair to me to critique the opposition as well, especially given how localists are slowly developing into a worrying direction. We will look at some examples later. This is not to say that the both sides are equivalent. No, the Chinese government has the second largest military in the world. It has an extensive state budget to quell dissent and quell unrest. It has an extensive state apparatus to do the same thing. The Hong Kong localists are organized via social media and have limited channel by which to express themselves following the national security law. Ideologically, however, it is just as important to reject nationalism and potential fascism on part of the Chinese government and on part of the Hong Kong localists. Let's take a look at this article posted by the Telegram channel called Hong Kong Revolution Guide in February 2020 when the coronavirus first started to spread internationally. Entitled, Not Our People, Stopping Chinese Festering in Hong Kong. The article writes, The only way to protect Hong Kong is to make the Chinese look on the Hong Kongers as fear. The message is the same as dealing with blue corpses. When our comrades start processing the blue corpses, they will not be as active as they were before. It is the same as the Chinese. Earlier, our comrades executed justice, and Wong Kok in the turn was forced to Chinese passages. This is a good start. Holy sh! I don't know about you, as a Chinese person, right there is fear in this. Let's break it apart. First, there is a clear dichotomy between what the article calls the Hong Kong nation and the Chinese people. The Chinese are ignorant to liberty because by their blood they are, and must be excluded from the body politic of Hong Kong because they are pathogens. In the words of Derrida, the concept of a Hong Kong nation, or in, in fact any nation, is entirely logocentric. That is to say, the concept of the Hong Kong nation can only be defined insofar as it excludes what they call Chinese people. In case the sense of fascism in this article is lost on you, take a look at the language and what the article is asking you to think and do here. You are to treat your political enemies as corpses. They are not worthy of sympathy because they are brain dead. You are to find enemies from within. They hide well because they look like you but do not be mistaken. They are enemies. They are pathogens. Any sympathies for the pathogens are detrimental. We are facing invasion. We are endangered. We are entitled to protect ourselves by eliminating them. From the same source, another article entitled The Chinese Are The Virus was this uh, amazing little graphic. Chinese pneumonia has exploded in Hong Kong. Swarms of Chinese flood Hong Kong, robbing us of our medical resources, spreading the virus downtown. The Chinese government pushes the responsibility of curing Chinese on Hong Kong, sacrificing Hong Kong people's lives to save the pathogens. Their essential goal is to cleanse Hong Kong with a plague. First of all, we can clearly identify an other that you are encouraged to fear and hate. Notice the complete absence of any statistics, because in the fictitious world that this article, or rather this piece of fascist propaganda has created, there is no requirement for facts. Fascism identifies itself as the savior of a great people in a fight against foreign colonizers and invaders, and the only solution is to completely remove those colonizers and invaders by any means necessary. Second, 
the identification of an organic body politic and the evasion of a pathological other is characteristic of fascism. The Nazi concept of the Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community, is exactly based on the same notion of the organic race. When the entire body of the folk is organic, then any alien intruder must be ruthlessly removed. Ironically, this rhetoric would give the Chinese government all the more legitimacy, all the more justification to crack down on existing protest movements by labeling them as fascist as they are. The article continues. In the past, many spread stupidity and accused the Hong Kong people of fighting the Chinese people instead of the Chinese government, and that this is in fact people fighting the people, or following your trap, or whitewashing the regime. In fact, the proponents of these incorrect theories are precisely whitewashing the Chinese, knowing that the Chinese are enemies. It is not whitewashing the regime. Instead, it is essential for Hong Kongers to protect themselves against the foreign danger. We are glad to see that Hong Kongers are coming to realize that no Chinese is innocent. At your place of residence, register where Chinese people live and block the doors of the pastures, paint their doors with marks, which helps the people identify the Chinese virus. At your school, work, or any organization with Chinese, box any Chinese students and employees, especially any pathogen who has been to China. We can even build an online database of Chinese patients in Hong Kong for citizens to be informed, make preventions, and enforce justice. Comrades with pro full protection can even actively clean up the Chinese pathogens. To be kind to the Chinese is to be cruel to the Hong Kongers. Wow. Doesn't this remind you of something? If this is not fascism, I don't know what is. If these people won't support Trump, I don't know who would. And unsurprisingly, they do support Trump because of course they do. Again, this may not be representative of many pan-democrats in Hong Kong who just call for universal suffrage, but it is dangerous to ignore the obvious fascism on the far right of the protest movements. But you also can't say, wow, the situation in Hong Kong is out of hand. As a Chinese person, I am scared. I am under attack. We need a strong government to stop this. No, that is to fall into the trap of the Chinese government. Ironically, the two sides aid each other in this process. Those who feel threatened by Chinese propaganda go to Hong Kong localist fascism, and those who f feel threatened by Hong Kong localist fascism support Chinese propaganda. A more interesting question than a warning to say, ah, look at these fascists. Maybe to ask why people have chosen this political position. One answer could be massive economic inequalities, resulting in a general feeling of economic disempowerment within the Hong Kong populace, especially amongst young people. The Index of Economic Freedom, published by the Heritage Foundation, lists Hong Kong as the most free economy of the world. And of course that is because Hong Kong is the most radically capitalist society in the world. Milton Friedman commends the city as a laboratory for unadulterated capitalism. It is the most laissez-faire society in the world, but its economic distributions are far from fair. Hong Kong's Gini coefficient stands at a staggering 0.539 according to Oxfam Hong Kong Inequality Report in 2018. Compare this to the United States where the number stands at 0.391 and in the UK where it stands at 0.351. This is the consequence of massive privatizations in housing, transportation, and utility services. The poorest of Hong Kong live in cages, while the rich live in massive houses, or indeed just Canada. The opposition in Hong Kong is not optimistic about the city's future. In the aforementioned Initium survey, 40% of localists and 48% of pan-democrats believe that the economic situation of their families will deteriorate within the next five years. An astounding 83% of localists believe that opportunities for upward mobility will continue to deteriorate, with 80% of democrats feeling the same thing. The classical Marxist response to this is to say, ah, Hong Kong has experienced the capitalist stage, the inherent crisis of capitalism is going to come, the proletariat, who has nothing to lose but their chains, will rise up and take the means of production to establish a true communist society. 
This did not happen in Hong Kong, and I don't think it ever will. Instead, what we have are masses who are clearly dissatisfied about the status quo, who know that something is wrong but point the conflict to one of quote-unquote national or ethnic conflicts. It does not matter that there is no clearly defined boundary of what is a Hong Konger and what is a Chinese person. It matters that one can scapegoat the Chinese person for all the economic woes of Hong Kong. Of course, Chinese multinational capital has made use of Hong Kong as a stop by which to expand their influences abroad, but this is a feature of capitalism, not a feature of Chinese passages taking over the formerly advanced British rule. Feeling economically disempowered, people need something to be angry at. So, why is it not capitalism? Because the idea of a popular leftist movement has been thoroughly discredited in Hong Kong, as the Communist Party has co-opted the name of a leftist movement and established the basic idea of what leftism looks like in Hong Kong. In a way, the CCP is smarter than they could ever consciously be. By advertising that they are leftist, they establish the Gulag Stalinist left as the archetypal image of leftism, hence making any genuine leftist opposition self-defeating and unworthy of engagement from the government or the opposition. The furthest left you can go in Hong Kong on the opposition is being a social democrat. And where does this remind you of? The political disempowerment that the opposition movement experiences after years of failure in combating the regime furthered this rise in localism. There weren't many people calling for Hong Kong independence right after its return to China. In fact, the term localism, Ben Tu Pai, had never received much press before 2016. Mainstream pan-democrats rarely supported the localist advocacy prior to the Umbrella Revolution in 2014. The failure of this campaign indicated to local citizens that Beijing is not actually interested in pushing democracy or electoral reforms. Consequently, trust in the central authority in Beijing declined, and the notion of an independent Hong Kong took on more credibility as a proclaim to protect the interests of Hong Kong and Hong Kong alone. This logic is extremely similar to the logic of the Trump presidential campaign. Trump sees the quote-unquote silent majority who the establishment have ignored for a long time, presuming them to be actually politically neutral. The masses in support of Trump do not have a concrete determined limited or obtainable goal. They do not even share any class interest. You can see bosses of industry and low-wage workers standing on one side in support of Donald Trump. And why is this? Because they have been cut off from the old conception of class interest and reinvented their consciousness into a so-called common interest of making America great again. Compare this again to the Chinese propaganda cartoon we saw earlier, where workers' movements were portrayed as foreign infiltration and an obstruction to the rejuvenation of Chinese nations. Despite their ostensible oppositions, the similarities are astounding. Consider again the Lacanian conception of the Big Other. All of these movements have leaders who claim not to be some perfect master who governs the nation. They have leaders who claim to be good servants for the Big Other. In the case of Hong Kong localists, this is the interest of so-called the Hong Kong people. But who actually counts as a Hong Kong person? They cannot be pinpointed to any specific legal boundaries as localists clearly don't see conservatives or mainland immigrants as part of the people. It is a virtual imagination that holds the ideology together. In the case of MAGA and China, the big other is the mythical rejuvenation of the nation. Of course, there is no specific actual and concrete point of reference to what that goal is, because then the movement would just be too self-defeating. Once you reach that point, there is no more justification. So just as Hitler threw away his 25 points, as soon as he grabbed power, the Chinese communists abandoned the ideological contents of Marxism, and Trump abandoned the mission of helping American workers the moment they were in office. Which is completely not surprising. Trump is literally the opposite of what a worker is. The appeals of all three parties, which I have described here, can be perfectly encapsulated by this paragraph written by Hannah Arendt. What the spokesmen of humanism and liberalism usually overlook is that an atmosphere in which all traditional values and propositions had evaporated made it easier to accept patently absurd propositions. Vulgarity was its cynical dismissal of respected standards and accepted theories carried with it a frank admission of the worst and a disregard for all pretenses 
which were easily mistaken for courage and a new way of life. It seemed revolutionary to admit cruelty, disregard of human values, and general amorality because this at least destroyed the duplicity upon which the existing society seemed to rest. What a temptation to flaunt extreme attitudes and the hypocritical twilight of double moral standards, to wear publicly the mask of cruelty if everyone was patently inconsiderate and pretended to be gentle, to parade wickedness in a world not of wickedness, but of meanness. Next time you come across similar rhetorics and political discourse, be cautious and beware. At any moment, we could become monsters, or worse, machines. Wow, you're still here. Thank you for watching the video all the way to the end. I hope this video has been somewhat interesting to you. If you liked it, remember to give it a like and subscribe. Uh, if you're upset that I called your ideology totalitarian, well, I'm sorry, but your ideology is totalitarian. Uh, share it around if you think someone else would find this helpful, enjoyable, whatever it is. Well, that's it for today. Have a good day. I'll see you in the next video.